The Edisto Island we see today looks in many places like it did thousands of years ago, in a period called the Late Archaic. The people here were thought to be hunter-gatherers constantly on the move, following the seasons for game and vegetation, leaving little trace of their passing through. But there is evidence that challenges that notion. How Spanish Mount got its name is a mystery. Its origin is from the time of Stonehenge and the first Great Pyramids, 3,500 years before Spaniards arrived in North America. Spanish Mount was described in 1808 as a pile of oyster shell 20 feet high covering half an acre. The site has been studied for decades and eroding for decades. Just nine months before Hurricane Irma took the last of it, archaeologists dug in for what would be a final look at the midden at Spanish Mount. This is what the bulk of the mound is made of. The dense oyster and you got crab claws and it's very ashy and uh, there's some charcoal in this. Um, and it's real loose, so that because there's not a lot of soil in it or sediment, it doesn't hold together very well. What meets the eye is solid oyster, but there are clams, whelks, blue crab, and periwinkle. The vertebrate remains identified 42 different animals, including alligator, fox, bobcat, and bald eagle. Deer made up almost half of the animal diet. Almost hidden in the massive volume of shell and bone are the remains of the other part of the late archaic diet, the plants. It's the southeast, so the climate is such that organic material is going to decay for the most part. The only stuff that we get are things that have basically been turned into pure carbon. So we get wood charcoal, we get nutshell, we get burned seed, and that allows us to begin to look at what people are using and how they're using it. By floating a sample, the heavier shell bits and pottery sink to the bottom while the less dense burned plant remains float, captured for identification. So we've got a nice smooth exterior of the shell, and then if you flip it over, it's um, kind of ridged and furrowed, and that's actually the little nut meat um, uh, channels inside of the nutshell. So that's, that's hickory nutshell. A short-lived species like a hickory nut can provide a very accurate date range, but to find it takes nuclear physics. In the lab, a sample is reduced by acid, rinsing, and heating all the way to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, changing from a solid to a gas and back to yield pure carbon graphite. A carbon atom has three isotopes, carbon-12, 13, and 14. When a plant or animal stops growing, the carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopes don't change, but carbon-14 begins to disappear in a process called radioactive decay. And for every one trillion atoms of carbon-12, and nearly the same amount for carbon-13, there is only one atom of carbon-14. This is the Accelerated Mass Spectrometer, or AMS, at the University of Georgia. At the source, carbon atoms pick up a negative charge. One million volts accelerate the carbon atoms to very high speeds, passing between alternating electrical and magnetic fields. Detectors inside count the carbon-13 and 14 isotopes. When the AMS data is processed, the result is a ratio. The bigger the difference between the two, the older the sample is. The samples from Spanish Mount range from 4,000 to 3,820 years ago. That puts Spanish Mount in the same date range as several close neighbors. Just five miles away is the largest and most complex of all the shell-bearing sites on the South Carolina coast. It's Fig Island, a trio of shell rings. Ring two is as wide as a football field and its walls were built with millions of oyster shells. The South Carolina Department of Natural Resources owns and protects Fig Island. There is no public access. Two miles from Fig Island in the Botany Bay Plantation Heritage Preserve is Pocky Island. Discovered in 2017, Pocky's two shell rings have been the focus of intense investigation in a race against the encroaching Atlantic. Artifacts from Spanish Mount and the other sites include finely carved bone pins. These took time, skill, and creativity, 
They were likely used for fastening clothing of deerskin, as needles for weaving or decoration for the body. We've got a couple of bone pins from Spanish Mount that are very distinctive in their design. That distinctive style has shown up at other sites, other late archaic shell-bearing sites on the Atlantic coast. It's an amazing piece of artwork, really, that's 4,000 years old. These decorations, they're, they're learned, um, they're passed on from generation to generation. I think it indicates that we're really dealing with related people. There is also evidence of trade at Spanish Mount, flakes of sedimentary rock and soapstone. The closest source is in the foothills of the upstate. This tells us that the people who deposited it here, who left it here, either traveled to get it directly or they traded to get it. Reverse engineering artifacts like this large mollusk, the knobbed whelk, reveals a toolkit of local resources. An all-purpose kind of digging tool, sledgehammer pick made out of a whelk, and the handle goes in so that the working ends of this thing sit more or less at right angles to the handle so you can dig, uh, you know, process stuff, crack things. Experimenting with sand, wet sand on a log, you can actually grind a good cutting edge onto these tools. And this takes a little longer than if you had a slab of kind of gritty stone to do this. Like I said, I wouldn't have any problem hafting this thing, putting a handle on it through here. A tiny mollusk, the periwinkle marsh snail, also had its purpose. Recreating designs in the lab reveals that many of the vessel's designs were impressed using the periwinkle. Archaeologists have seen the designs at Spanish Mount at other sites along the southeast coast. It's another indicator of family ties across hundreds of miles. White-tailed deer was a large part of the diet on the South Carolina coast. Without stone for projectile points for hunting, there was a local solution. Well, if you don't have these, you've got to look around and improvise. We don't know what else they have, but we know that we see antler projectile tips. We've uh, got a number of these from the site itself. They are taking a sharp tool. You could use a flint or chert tool or maybe even a shell tool to cut the antler, girdle that antler tine, snap it off, and then drill into it with a stone or other drill to make a socket in there. And you can put these onto shafts. We have two different versions of it right here. This is the one that is uh, attached directly to the cane shaft and this is one that is four shafted so we don't know which what which method was used but both are perfectly functional these spears would have been thrown with a weapon called a spear thrower or you often hear this is called an atl atl spelled a-t-l a-t-l and these can be made entirely from wood and other uh, natural materials but we find a uh, number of antler hooks for these to show that they took a lot of effort, uh, put a lot of effort and uh, pride into their craftsmanship to make a quality weapon. These things were often weighted to give uh, balance and uh, power to the throw. But it's similar to archery. In fact, I argue oftentimes that uh, spear throwing with an atlatl is archery, that much of the same terminology applies. You would take this weapon and put the hook in the back of the spear and throw it in order to push that spear along from the very back end and then release it. And there you go, that's the atl level for you. In December of 2022, archaeologists investigated the forest behind Spanish Mount to look for evidence of a settlement. Setting a five meter grid behind the shell midden the team dug 221 shovel test pits. The early analysis points to a surprising discovery, another shell ring. Radiocarbon dates show that these earliest known coastal dwellers constructed sites of shell around Edisto for nearly 500 years. Were these sites for great feasts or festivals, or to extend families or select leaders, or simple villages that formed in circles? the big questions remain. You know, part of it is understanding, you know, how people dwelled within these environments, you know, just how they made their living, you know, how that, that unique interaction with these very special environments 
permeated, you know, all aspects of their lives, from their way in which they thought about the cosmos and ideology to um, how they, you know, were going to feed their children from year to year. We want to we want to be both conscious of of the people that are absent that um, are now. Native Americans that are displaced into places like Oklahoma and other places through Trail of Tears that probably have deeper connections to here than we do, um, certainly. And then we also want to be really conscious of, of the people that were once here. And there's a, a really strong possibility these shell rings were a version of what we might think of as, as a church or a synagogue or a mosque or somewhere really deeply spiritually important. Those rings had different functions that, that together formed a kind of a cosmological and sociological and religious whole that we don't understand yet. Despite our best efforts, there are always going to be questions that we can't answer or that we can only answer in a, in a partial way. Um, and that's absolutely the most frustrating thing about doing what we do. You know, answering that basic question of who we are and where do we come from, that's pretty fundamental to being human. So what's more important than that question?